Hey, Daniel. G'day. Doreen. Hi, Daniel. Bit of a, bit of, bit, bit of a, bit of a co complicated day, so uh, all good. Well, look, now, now that we have everybody here, I'm going to um, kick us off and, and throw over to Simone. So welcome to everybody. Um, who's joined us on the call today. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Sam Freeman, the Trade and Investment Commissioner for Austrade, based in Bengaluru in India. Um, I lead our tech and innovation program um, for the region, which includes the Australia India Innovation Network, which is the program under which today's webinar is arranged. Um, and we're very delighted to be working with uh, both InsureTech Australia and the India InsureTech Association on a series of webinars about uh, the two different countries and the, the landscapes in each. So um, I'm joined today by Simone. Uh, Simone is the CEO of InsureTech Australia and was previously with Munich Re um, in, in Australia. We've got Daniel Fogarty, who's the CEO and founder of Ivari, nicely branded on the shirt there as well. <laughs> and uh, Matthias Hellersbro, um, who's with previously with QBE Insurance, now with QBE Ventures as Senior Manager, Strategy and Partnerships. So really thank you uh, for your time today to join us, to give us some insights on uh, the insure tech and insurance industry in Australia. And I'll throw over to Simone um, for her initial comments. Thank you, Sam, um, and thank you, Austrade. It's great to be able to participate in this exchange. We're always keen to be able to work and showcase what we do and, and showcase Australia. Um, before we give it, begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners and custodians of their land. I'm on the land of the Jerin Gitara tribe of the Wandi Wurundjeri people, um, and we pay our respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, um, and and those that are um, supporting our industry. Um, so, InsureTech Australia is a member association, uh, not for profit. We've been in existence for about five years and three years as an association. So, we're uh, a quite a mature ecosystem. We have 90 InsureTech partners and about 45 um, corporate partners with insurers such as QBE and others in the insurance value chain. And, and we really connect and, and build those relationships um, between the, the startups and those that are um, scaling their businesses in how they can work with the insurers um, and how they can build their own insurance businesses um, through events and networking and, and communication channels. And we're also um, always look for opportunities to bring our insurer, Australian InsurTechs um, to the global stage, which is where we work with Austrade, um, and also opportunities to connect with uh, global InsurTechs that are looking and are wanting to understand the, the Australian market. So we also have a number of InsurTech members that are have come into the Australian market um, from other jurisdictions. Um, so it's probably all I'll say. We'll, we'll have, explore a lot more about um, the industry and where it's where it's at. The insurance industry is quite mature in Australia. We're probably the fifteenth in in terms of size globally, um, and there's a lot of regulation, and we we can talk about that and, and the competition. Um, so I might just. Um, go over to our two panellists to give a bit more of an introduction about themselves um, and their company and what they do and where they fit in the ecosystem as a starting point. So, um, Daniel, do you want to start? Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, and look, thanks for the opportunity to be part of the uh, uh, today's session. Uh, thank you, Austrade. Uh, we get great support uh, from Austrade uh, in Australia. So uh, lots of uh, lots of Australian insure techs are looking to uh, uh, expand globally. That, that's definitely the case for us, and we can't do that without the help of Austrade. So, so thank you very much from our Austrade colleagues for organising today. Uh, my uh, my background: I was the CEO for Zurich Insurance for Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so I ran the general insurance business uh, for Zurich uh, here and in, in, in New Zealand. Uh, in in uh, and, and prior to that, I was at SunCorp uh, in the personal insurance business. So I've had a career that's sort of personal insurance, uh, small business, and and large corporate. Uh, and started Avari uh, with two with two co-founders. Originally, we started in Australia. Uh, we're now uh, the, based in the UK and Australia. Uh, we have clients in the US, uh, the UK, and Australia. Uh, and what we do is we provide uh, the end-to-end -end insurance software for um, uh, for the insurance process. And we've done that in a way where we can provide great flexibility to to end consumers, so to customers, to be able to uh, interact with their insurance. Uh, the, the best way they want to, 
Um, but most importantly, it's for, uh, for underwriters and brokers to be able to have flexibility in the way they interact with their customers. Uh, and we've, what we've found is that all insurance systems are built very, in a very set way and they don't provide the flexibility for insurers or brokers to be able to offer things in different ways. And that's, uh, that's really the, uh, uh, the issue we're addressing. Uh, anyway, and, and I sit on the board of uh, InsureTech Australia as well, so uh, work very closely with uh, uh, Simone. Thank you. Stan and, and Matthias, you tell us a bit about yourself and, and QBA Ventures. Yes, absolutely. So, so first of all, super excited to, to join today and thanks so much for organizing this session. Uh, really exciting to be part of it. Um, so yeah, my name is Matthias Hallerspo and uh, um, as Sam mentioned before, uh, part of QB Insurance and now QB Ventures. So I work in the strategy and partnership space of QB Ventures. Uh, and, and previously I worked in the strategy team at QB. And prior to that, I have a, a management consulting uh, background. Um, so a little bit more about QB Ventures and uh, my role within it. Uh, so QB Ventures is the corporate venture capital arm of, of QB Insurance. Uh, and QB Ventures work um, globally uh, within QB, uh, so with all uh, all QB's divisions and, and countries, uh, and currently our team of about ten people are uh, based across uh, Australia, UK, and and the US, uh, and we've structured ourselves uh, in a way so that we have sort of one strategy and partnership part, which I'm part of, one investment area, and then sort of a tech. He's spanning across those two areas and also sort of a venture build capability that we're building up as well. Uh, and, and the reason for structuring ourselves that way is really that QB Ventures is, is a lot about um, not only sort of the, the investment from a financial standpoint, but very much so working together with uh, the startups that we do invest in and, and partner with to really collaborate with the QBE business. So, so sort of a conduit between, uh, between those startups and the QBE uh, business. Um, so uh, we, we look at companies that are uh, strategically aligned to, to QBE insurance. And, and as you might know, uh, QBE insurance is um, mainly a commercial insurer if you look sort of internationally, but a, also a consumer insurance within uh, the Australian borders. Uh, so, so it's quite a broad remit uh, for the team and, and super exciting to be part of. All right, thanks, Matthias. Um, we thought we'd start with just a bit of an overview of the Australian insurance ecosystem. Dan, do you want to have a, a go first at just talking about, I guess, the major players and, and what are they doing um, and where, just give people a bit of a snapshot. Yeah, look, and there's uh, there's 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 a fair bit of uh, information available to people uh, if you want to look more at the insurance system in Australia. Um, uh, APRA, the uh, the industry regulator, provides information about the the turnover of uh, of things like how, how, how big the gross written premium is. Um, so if people go to APRA publications, uh, A P R A, so Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, um, you can get a fair bit of information there. So, so to give you my view of this, um, you know, really there's, there's three large uh, domestic players uh, who are listed on the on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, obviously, QBE well represented here, uh, and then uh, um, IAG uh, and SunCorp. Um, so IAG stands for Insurance Australia Group. Uh, both IAG and Suncorp have a house of brands, so they have multiple brands. Uh, so that the the retail brands of uh, like NRMA um, and uh, and uh, RACV, which is fifty percent owned by by IAG, uh, and then in the Suncorp suite, it has Suncorp obviously as a direct brand. Uh, it has Amy and other brands like that. Um, yeah, the three big players uh, sort of, I, I feel, dominate, dominate the market. Um, and uh, then we've got international players. So Allianz is the next biggest. Uh, in, the, in the Allianz network, uh, I, I believe that Australia is about number four in the Allianz network. So it's got a very, it's got a higher proportion uh, here than it has in other countries. Um, and then you get into the other, the other international brands uh, beyond that at a, at a, at a sort of a corporate level, so you know Zurich and uh, Chubb and uh, um, uh, players like that. 
in the in the domestic space, uh, there are three other names that have sort of come mainly from South African money, I think. Uh, so you've got uh, Yui, um, which is uh, um, which is a, a, a mainly a, a domestic brand doing doing some in the small business space. Um, uh, you've got um, uh, Hollard, which is which is owned by the and uh, by the you know and supported by the Enthoven family, um, and then uh, um, uh, and then you've got uh, a Budget Direct or, or AGH, uh, and those those three those three uh, competitor brands are doing are doing very well. They're, they're gaining a lot of share. They're gaining that share, particularly from SunCorp and IAG. Um, but they've spent a lot of money on marketing. I mean, uh, Yui people say that Yui has spent sort of, uh, you know, 600 or 800 million Aussie on marketing. So um, if you want to compete in that space, you, you need a very big capital spend uh, to be successful there. Um, and then and then the other the other thing that's big in the Australian market is, is Lloyd's. So, so Lloyd's is a, is a very big market. Uh, sorry, Australia is a very big market for Lloyd's globally. Um, obviously, the, the, the heritage of our country uh, with the UK has driven that, but also um, the, the, the way that our industry works, works well for Lloyd's cover holders. Um, so when we started Avari, we were actually Lloyd's cover holder, uh, taking capacity out of the Lloyd's market and, and deploying it in Australia. Uh, we, we no longer offer insurance direct uh, in our business, but the, um, uh, the, 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 that, that sort of business, the Lloyd's cover holder business, um, you know, or in, in other parts of the world, people call them MGAs. Uh, in Australia, we call them underwriting agencies. So. Uh, here we have a we have a slightly different word for MGAs, uh, but the, uh, the 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 underwriting agency market is is a significant part of this, particularly the small and medium sized business market, um, because you're going to have a lot of specialty business come come in through there. And I said it comes in through Lloyd's, but it also comes in through the big players as well. So QBS is a supporter of of the underwriting agency market, as as is Allianz. Uh, as are, as are other players direct um, directly into the market as well. So um, yeah, it, it, it's a well worn path. If, if people are thinking about coming to Australia, then that underwriting agency model is a good one. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, a way a lot of insure tech set up, uh, and um, uh, and you can compete in in in, in particular lines. Uh, as as far as the whole industry is concerned, the biggest products uh, in the industry are, are similar to the rest of the world. You know, the biggest product in the Australian market is definitely motor insurance, uh, and it's it's it, it is followed not far not far behind by home insurance. Uh, home insurance is a, is a complicated product in the Australian market, mainly driven by natural cat catastrophe. Um, you know, we've, we've, it's been a very busy year for natural catastrophe here, and and it, and it will continue to be. Um, uh, you know, it's just I've, I've just been on a plane from Sydney to Melbourne and looking looking out at how much water there is still everywhere. You're just reminded of how of, of what a difficult season it's been for natural catastrophe. Uh, and then and then for, for the rest of the markets, you know, as you'd expect, Australia is a well advanced market uh, across all of the uh, across all of the commercial lines. Um, so there's a there's a there's a big market here for all those uh, all those lines. Um, you know, we have a big liability market. Uh, you know, we have a big financial lines market. Um, obviously, commercial property is is big. All all the things you'd expect to see in a in a, in an advanced market, um, and it's very competitive. We're we're in a hard market at the moment, so there's uh, there's there's less capacity than than customers would want. Um, yeah. Anyway, hopefully that's a uh, that's a good a good a good intro. Uh, uh, people might have other ways of describing it. So back to you, Simone. Thanks, Dan. And of course, that's just general. There's also life insurance as well, which has a, a whole range of different players, um, and it's also a fairly mature market. But um, I'll just go over to Matthias. And um, QBA, as you said before, is so with large Australian presence and market share, but but is really the sort of global insurer and, and positions it itself as that. How do you, I guess, see the Australian market given that global perspective? And and what do you think are, are opportunities for insure techs um, looking to enter into the to the Australian market? Uh, yes, yeah, a great question. So I think in terms of Indian insure techs entering into the Australian market, I think the the headline is that there are great opportunities to to do so. Uh, um, but as with any market, I think there's sort of it's key to understand where those pockets of opportunities lie. And I'll, I'll try to give my perspective on it a little bit. Um, and and I think. Probably very, there's of course many different ways to to enter a bar market, but if if sort of broadly categorizing it into two buckets of sort of entering through strategic partnerships with Australian players such as 
insurers or brokers or reinsurers or sort of looking to enter in a different way to compete with those said players. Uh, I, I think the, the former sort of the strategic partnership route with, with for example, Australian insurers is a, um, is a somewhat viable route. And I think so for, for a few reasons. Probably number one is that uh, I think there's definitely a role for foreign insurtechs and, and Indian insurtechs included to, to play a role in enabling that modernization journey and the development of new proposition and the development of uh, more digitized uh, go-to-market models uh, together with Australian players, um, depending on what your insurtech, of course, uh, is, is focused on. And secondly, that sort of route also ensures, of course, a access to that local market knowledge and access to those local customers. And thirdly, sort of just shortening the time and, and minimizing the, the efforts that you have to spend to actually enter that, that market. So that's just a little bit about sort of um, those two broad categories and, and sort of partnering with a player might be a one route to go and then more linked to, um, I suppose, the specific opportunities uh, within that option. I would probably think a little bit about sort of the um, or at least my way of thinking about it is probably looking a little bit at the Indian market and understanding the trends there and looking at sort of what, where are the alignment points uh, for the trends in the Indian market and the Australian market. And um, uh, joining the session last week actually gave some, some really good uh, trends. And I, I know that session was uh, reported as, uh, uh, sort of recorded as well. Um, but, but some key takeaways for me where I saw some alignment with the Australian market was probably around the rise of um, digital distribution enablers in the Indian market, including for embedded insurance. And I think that's super interesting, given kind of the, uh, the rise of the, the same area in Australia and, and uh, potentially looking at collaboration across the borders there. Uh, the, the second key takeaway for me uh, from that session around the trends in India was kind of insurtech starting to more partner directly with insurers and brokers. Uh, and that's, of course, kind of very aligned to what I'm talking about with strategic partnerships in Australia. And that could happen here as well with, with foreign insurtechs, I think. Uh, and something, of course, that we're an example of in, in the QBE Ventures team, uh, for example. Uh, as, as one one route uh, and, and thirdly sort of the just a growing uh, there's always been a really big tech community and, and well advanced tech community in India but also the growing insurance focused within that tech community I think just further reflects the possibility to to sort of partner for enablement in Australia um, and for that other category then in terms of just where the view is more to uh, to enter in a different way, perhaps, and, and more compete with existing insurer, insurers in, in Australia. I would probably think about the, um, the opportunities in terms of emerging risk classes, perhaps, where existing players in, in Australia aren't, aren't as present, present yet. And I think that that's especially the case because there are, uh, to, to Daniel's point before as well, there, there's a few major brands holding a very large share in some of the uh, important risk classes in, in Australia across both personal and commercial lines, making it a somewhat tough market to enter from a few perspectives. So, so if looking at, at it from that perspective, then I think... I, I would probably think sort of about the emerging classes and risk classes and how, how you might enter those. Um, yeah, so, so that's probably just a few thoughts on those two, two categories and, and the opportunities there. Thanks, Matthias. Um, yeah, really interesting around, yeah, how do I guess the, we take the, the strengths of that Indian market and, and bring it in and then align it with, yeah, some of those gaps and, and, uh, and niches that might be, might be the opportunities that the, the insurers can then partner with. Um, Daniel, you've obviously, you know, grown in an Australian insurtech business and, and have lots of, I guess, experience of how easy or difficult that is. Uh, what would be, I guess, some of the learnings or advice you would give um, to those sort of coming in? What do you think are the key 
challenges in the market that um, anyone sort of entering needs to be aware of and those kind of hot topics? Yeah, look, I think there's uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of things going on in our market which, uh, which, which have changed over, over the years. Australia used to be one of the best markets uh, from a profitability point of view. Um, so you go back 10 years ago when you, and, and there was lots of interest in our market because of, uh, of, of profitability, but that has, that has shrunk away. So, that, so, that, so generally the market is, is not that profitable uh, anymore. I mean, it is still a profitable market and there, and there are very definitely parts of the market that are, are profitable. So I'd say the first challenge for anyone coming into the market is, is understand where the profit pools are and understand where those profit pools are going to move. Uh, and where you can bring your advantage to those profit pools. Um, you know, as, as, uh, as we've all talked about, you know, the, the, the big players in this market make, um, make it difficult to compete in the direct market. Uh, look, it's not impossible to compete in the direct market. So if you've got a, if you've got a good offering, uh, you can compete in the direct market. Um, you know, it, insurance marketing spend is as big here as it is in any other country. Um, you watch, you watch, sport and you get lots of lots of advertisements for insurance uh, uh, through that. So, you know, if you don't have that 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 horsepower behind you, then then you're not going to capture the, the whole market. But having a niche strategy uh, definitely does work um, the because the players are big in this market, particularly in, in, in home and motor, they have a cost advantage that, that's very hard to match. Um, yeah, because there is su such a concentration of the motor market with both IAG and Suncorp. Um, yeah, they've got their own. They've got their own repair centres. They've got their own repair processes. Uh, they're driving cost out, out of out of that whole process. Um, so so while they may not be very may not be as good on technology and customer service as as a as a startup would be, um, if they can win on price and, and they've got data, yeah, so they can win because they can get their, their cost down. They can win because they've got data to price better. Then uh, and 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 these companies are sophisticated prices. You know. Um, Risk address pricing and and flexible pricing has been in Australia for about twenty years. Um, so we've got you know a lot of the um, a lot of the Australians actually took a, you know, quite a bit of the work that happened in the US came out of Australia. Um, so there was a a, a a pricing company in Sydney that went and did a lot of work with Progressive and uh, Geico and uh, so a lot of that a lot of that start that thinking started down here has has been exported. Um, and pe people don't know that because they go, oh well, Geico and Progressive have got have got good pricing. And yeah, well, they learn it. They learn it from a country that does actually have a lot of catastrophe problem, which is why we've had to learn it down here. Um, so, like I'd say, I'd say there are challenges there, but there are also opportunities, and, and depends on on how big the niche is you want to go after. I mean, Australia is not as obviously big as the uh, U.S. market, where where people can create huge businesses in the niche in the U.S. market. Um, our niches aren't aren't always huge, but they're but they're big enough to get started. And, and if it's part of a global strategy, then uh, then you might say, look, I can get a a certain size business here. Um, but we do have other people looking at the niches. It's not it's, there's not it's not a greenfield. Um, there is quite a bit of money uh, in in those niches. And I said underwriting agencies have done particularly well in Australia because they've been funded by um, you know those. Those mid-level uh, insurance businesses like Steadfast, which 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 listed, uh, you know, um, you know, not that long ago, but has has a lot of capital behind it. Um, yeah, you know, you've got PSC that's listed. You've got AUB Group that's listed. So you've got you've got these companies that have access to money that are thinking about those as well. So I think the the for someone coming into this market, it's about doing a lot of research of understanding what the market is and and what the opportunities are. Being very humble about your your what what you can bring to another market. I mean, we've uh, we've we've entered into two other markets, so we're wearing both the US uh, and the UK. Um, you can think your stuff is really good, and and some of our stuff down under is really good, and we and we and we can take it offshore. Um, yeah, the, one of the advantages we have as Australians when we go offshore is because our market is relatively smaller compared to these big markets in the world. Uh, Australian insure techs are by their very nature thinking right the way across the value chain. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that's what we've done. We've created the, the, the technology for the whole end-to-end -end value chain because we had to do it, you know, and, then, and, and we, we wanted to be deep, deep in a niche. Um, so uh, they're, they're, they're things to think about. Look, as far as um, other challenges coming into this market, um, it's interesting this week we just had a big, uh, there was a big industry forum on, on, on you know, what, 
uh, uh, reviewing what 2022 was like and, 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 and talking about the challenges come, coming forward for the new year. Um, and look at the, the, uh, the, the ones that I expected to see there were there, which is about um, yeah, regulation. Uh, it's about response to natural cats. We've already talked about, uh, and, but it's also about affordability. Uh, affordability is now becoming a big issue in particularly in a harder market. Um, but another one that, that, that came up a lot, uh, which, which is elsewhere as well, is really the, the war on talent. Um, so there, 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 are, there are less people here. So as you come to this market, um, you know, don't expect to pick up people very easily. Um, you know, if, you've got a strong, if you've got a strong proposition, then I know there are a lot of frustrated people in the big organisations. So um, QBE would say they do lose people to, to, these, to these more um, entrepreneurial businesses, but, but don't come here expecting there to be plenty of people to pick from because uh, there is a big war for talent, particularly those who have you know, five to 10 years experience and, and you need those people. Um, uh, so I think uh, I think that's something I would add to that as well, and, and really the yeah you know, the whole now focus on ESG, um, you know, so it's environmental. That that that's a big thing that is going to become increasingly. And again, that that's something that uh, someone offshore can bring that expertise here, um, and and then managing the whole economic and supply chain. I mean, the the, the uh, inflation here is going up. Uh, that that impacts insurers. Um, so so the economic situation and and the supply chain situations that we're still dealing with off the back of COVID uh, are things to think about. So um, yeah, there's, 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 there's a lot of uh, challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunities and all that there's opportunities uh, because my, yeah, my frustration is our market's not moving quick enough on innovation. Um, and I think the reason why they're not is because there are so many other things for insurers to worry about as, as we talk about regulation, uh, talent, uh, affordability, um, that cat, you know, they're, they're all busy dealing with those things going, well, how can we take things to the next level? Uh, and the insure techs are going, well, we want you to move quicker. And if you move quicker, you'd actually solve solve a lot of these issues in the process. Um, so, uh, yeah, but, and uh, they're, they're, they're more things to think about. So hopefully, hopefully that gives, it gives a good list, Simone. Yeah, it's a, it's a very big list. Um, lots of things for people to, to research and be aware of. And, and um, yeah, lots of things to kind of get ready. Uh, Matthias, your perspectives on that. Um, what would be your, I guess, advice of how um, how the insure techs, you know, people entering the market, how do they understand it? What are the things they should be sort of focusing on? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think in terms of understanding the Australian market and and trying to build a little bit on on Daniel's points here as well. Um, there, there are a few, I think, key trends that are important to to consider. Uh, and that I think many, many players in the Australian market is working through at the moment. And, and those are probably similar to, to some other markets as well. But, but I think if, if, if sort of taking them one by one a little bit, uh, I think starting off and, and Daniel mentioned uh, a few points on this as well, but I, I would sort of think about one really broad theme as, as resilience. Uh, and there's many, many perspectives within resilience, I think, but, but ultimately, I think insurers have a role to play in helping its customers and its communities to become more resilient across a number of, of areas. Uh, for example, climate risk, uh, as, as weather events become sort of more, more frequent and more severe, and, and also cyber risk and, and supply chain interruptions. So I think, I think that's a, an area that has a lot of opportunities within it um, and, and the big role for insurtechs to, to play in sort of uh, going after those, um, those areas and, and understanding uh, how to develop as an insurers within the space of resilience. Uh, and second one I would probably mention in terms of kind of trends that, that um, the industry is working through, I think is sort of around business model innovation uh, so, for example, new digital go-to-market models such as embedded insurance is, is a quite obvious one. And then, then thirdly, I think sort of just a value chain innovation where insurtechs, of course, have a really big role to play and in line to what I talked about before about sort of strategic partnerships with, with Australian players. So, for example, better leveraging data and machine learning to, to improve your underwriting and risk selection and, and so on. So I think that that's a big opportunity space to look into as well. Um, and the, the fourth one I would mention is probably sort of emerging risks and how to better understand those emerging risks. 
um i think i think it's easy to uh to sort of focus on the here here and now and, and more difficult probably to do that as, at the same time as you try to understand how should we approach those uh, emerging risks such as cyber for example but also other ones um and and the last one i'll mention is probably around uh, sort of proactive risk management as an opportunity space as well so i think i think that's just the role of the insurance industry and, and its various players in extending beyond that risk transfer to risk prevention and, and risk management as well. Uh, and that's also, I think, an area in the Australian market that, that is uh, a big role for, for insurtechs to play in sort of uh, thinking about that and, and, and collaborating on that. Um, and, and maybe just to bring bring this to life a little bit, to, to give an example from from that first theme of of resilience as a broad theme. Um, so, for example, QB Ventures recently invested in a company called Geosight, uh, which is a geospatial data aggregation platform. Uh, so, for risk insights, for underwriting, and for for claims purposes. Uh, so that that sort of unifies several different data sources to optimize the process flow for claims reserving and for cap risk underwriting and, and, and so on. So I think that that's a, just an example of kind of um, the, the things to start, that start to take place within one of those themes. And then uh, lo a lot of activity, I think, in the Australian market across all of those um, five themes that I mentioned there. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. I mean, I think that's why everyone's kind of so busy across trying to do all these things uh, simultaneously. I definitely agree that, you know, resilience is a topic that's that's high on the agenda, um, I guess, because it sort of directly hits the bottom line. But I think all the major insurers, that's their kind of core purpose is around that sort of resilience. But at the mm. same time, they've got to innovate and create new business models and digitise. So, um, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Um, uh, so, we talked a bit before about that sort of regulatory oversight. Dan, I guess, what's your, um, I guess, experience or perspective on the Australian regulatory environment, maybe sort of compared to some of the other other locations and, and what to sort of people need to keep in mind around um, making sure they're across that? Yep, great, thanks. Um, look, I should give it a little bit of background on this. So as part of, as part of my role with InsureTech Australia, um, I, uh, I sit on the ASICs, uh, so ASIC is the Australian regulator. Um, uh, so ASIC has a digital finance advisory panel, uh, of which there are eight sort of uh, industry members. So I'm, I'm one of the uh, I'm one of the industry members. I represent the insurance industry. Um, there are people there re representing crypto lending, uh, other uh, you know other parts of the, the financial services industry as well. Um, so, uh, so I have a bit of I have a bit of experience and insight into what's happening uh, on on the regulatory landscape, uh, and I'd say, look, our, our regulators uh, and, and and we have like uh, similar similar to the UK, we have two two regulators. So you've got the APRA that regulates the the the, the insurance, the, the 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 taking of risk, um, and then ASIC regulates the distribution of of, of risk. So uh, most people need an ASIC license. Not everyone needs a APRA license, um, and so uh, so if you're an underwriting agency, you need a you need an ASIC license to be able to uh, provide insurance into the market. Obviously, you're not taking the end risk because of the nature of that uh, um, that sort of Lloyd's cover holder structure or that that MGA structure, because someone like like QBE or Lloyd's are actually taking taking the end risk. Um, and uh, and so so to get a to get an ASIC license, you need people who are qualified. Um, look, it's not it's not that hard if you've got if you've got if you've got Australians working with you who've been working in the market, um, then it is possible to get a to get an ASIC license. Um, there are there are also uh, you become an authorised rep, an authorised representative of, an, of another company. So uh, so for, from that perspective, again, you can get licensed as as an authorised rep of someone else. So again, you need to know people here, and as Matthias talked about before, partnering is an important thing there. So if you partner with one of the firms. That have licenses, uh, you know, you can if you want to do that sort of thing, you'd come back through InsurTech Australia, or, or you or you'd talk to the folks at uh, the Underwriting Agency Council of Australia, or maybe you talk to Lloyd's about that too, about how to get into that market and get that license, uh, and who can su support you in that. Um, now, then within, well, then once you're licensed uh, in, in in our market, 
the regulator is a pretty tough regulator. I mean, look as you'd expect. Um, and, uh, and what happened across the whole market, uh, we had a financial services inquiry uh, about two years ago. Um, it's, it's then, unfortunately, it uncovered a whole lot of stuff, particularly the banks were doing not that well. It wasn't, it wasn't focused on insurance, uh, but all the financial services got caught up in this, in this inquiry. Uh, and now there is a huge amount of new legislation that is that is either hit the market in the last six months uh, or is coming into the market in the next six months. So uh, unfortunately, one of your first uh, employees is probably going to be a regulation lawyer uh, if you're down here or, or, or you'll have to be spending money on making sure you're getting the right compliance advice. And again, there are there are there are people who can give that compliance advice. There are some great people involved in the InsureTech Australia network who can provide that advice as well. Um, and, and, and the Australian regulators are, 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 um, are very well aligned with the regulators elsewhere in the world. Uh, so, um, you know, it's interesting having, having worked at Zurich previously and uh, a lot of these regulators meet in Basel, the amount of times I, I was going back to head office for Zurich uh, and there'd be a, um, you know, the banking regulators going to Basel or there'd be the, the insurance regulators going. Um, so so we, th there's a lot of cooperation between uh, between countries on, on regulation. I, I think Australia is pushing regulation quite hard um, and, uh, and, and you really need to know about what's happening there. But look, if you're, if you're treating customers fairly and you're doing the right things, then, then you know, you, you sort of got to come from that place about, you know, how, how can we treat the customer fairly? Um, and, then, and then in Australia, we have a very, we, we've centralised all the, the complaints authorities. Uh, there's a a centralised complaints authority called AFCA, which uh, stands for the Australian Financial Services Complaints Authority. Um, uh, it, it centralises all the complaints, and and what's happening is that AFCA are, are ruling in in in, uh, in favour of insureds a lot. So um, you know, insurers don't want to go to AFCA if we're going to if we're going to avoid it. Um, but there's sort of like you know, so you need to follow the regulations, and then if your customer complains. Um, you've got you've got Africa to deal with to deal with if 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 they escalate that. Um, so dealing things through. Uh, so you need a really good uh, IDR, so internal dispute resolution. Uh, one thing's got EDR, so the external distribution. They go to Africa, um, and and then and then ASIC's doing its own checks as well. Um, we do have a uh, insurance sandbox in Australia. Um, unfortunately, uh, we uh, it's it's not it's not as usable as sandboxes elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, like Singapore has a better sandbox than Australia does, um, and 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 ASIC is keen to use that, but but it hasn't found really any anyone to do that yet. So um, uh, uh, all good. That that's probably a um, so it can be navigated, but you need to get advice. And uh, I'd come through Simone, Simone, and and uh, Simone can give you some great people to help help give you a panel of people to help think about giving you advice on that. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, there certainly is. Um, Sam, I wondered whether you wanted, I think there's a couple of questions that come through. Do we want to um, jump to some of those? Yeah. yeah, there's been some really good questions come through. Thanks, Simone. I think um, any uh, anybody else, please do put your questions in the chat and we'll try and answer them as we go through the last sort of 20 minutes or so. Um, open to anybody answering this one, but what uh, technology services are booming in the Australian insurance landscape? Is there particular technologies that are underpinning a lot of the new insure tech solutions? Yeah, pro pro probably all three of us could answer that one. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll start with my view. Look, there's still, there's still a lot of very old technology in Australia. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, the, the usual players at the big end of town are, are, are getting market share. So Guidewire is well used in this market. Uh, Duck Creek is, uh, is is also very prevalent here. Um, you know, and there are a num number of other other firms here as well. Um, look, I'd, I'd say that what's what people are doing is 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 people aren't replacing their core; they're replacing things on the on 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 the, on, the, on the edge. So people are looking for new uh, new digital experiences. So there's money being spent on that, um, and then dealing with uh, you know dealing with claims and things that, that are really pressing. So uh, Look, I wouldn't say there is a, a prevalent technology. There's a lot of scope for more technology in this market. Um, underwriting agencies are particularly cost focused because they're usually quite small. Uh, um, but the, uh, the the market's not moving and adopting this as quickly as as as, as we as insurtechs would like. Probably because they're you know they're, they're, they're busy dealing with these other major issues uh, at the moment. 
Yeah, I'll, pro I'll probably just add to that. And I completely agree with, with Daniel and, and uh, probably just add to that, just sort of related to, for example, those trends that I, I talked through before around sort of resilience and, and digital distribution and, and so on. So I would agree with, with Daniel that it's kind of maybe not replacing the core, but sort of placing your bets within some of those key trends, depending on where you choose to, uh, to focus. And uh, uh, for example, if we take embedded insurance as an example, several players sort of popping up in, in terms of uh, being the tech provider for, for that and enabling, enabling that piece between a distribution partner and a insurer as an example, or or sort of um, enabling that geospatial piece that I, I talked about before. So I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, uh, sort of technology providers that aren't necessarily sort of core systems, but but adding to those strategic bets along the trends that you see in the in the market. Great, thanks. Uh, Simone, did you want to add on or jump onto one of the other ones? I just say, yeah, there's there's scope for just really some basic stuff um, that people still are still trying to fix, you know, lots of legacy and, and acquisitions. And then people are also adopting some of that sort of more, more um, innovative, you know, there's more sort of leading technologies. Um, so it's really right across the, the scope that there's, there's room for new technologies. Thanks. So one of the other questions is around the health market. Um, obviously, there's a big play there with uh, things like life insurance. But what do you guys see at the moment in Australia in terms of uh, health practitioners? Uh, is the health industry spending big on IT? Are they looking at uh, spending in insured tech area? What, what do you see in the health market? So I might just jump in first. Um, so in terms of their engagement with the insure tech ecosystem, it's certainly behind the other sectors in terms of we just um, did a recent member survey and it's probably only 20, 25% of our um, members are focused on the health segment and, and we have one uh, health insurer that's joined as, as a corporate partner. I think that reflects that uh, the structure of the insurance market in Australia is um, quite separate from general and, and life insurance and uh, quite, um, it's very sort of predetermined in terms of the outcomes of how they can price and how they um, can effectively structure their products and how that interacts with the, you know, effectively the, the national um, Medicare system it means that health is really sort of uh, limited in how it can really innovate as such. So we are seeing um, an interest in, in innovation, but it's probably not the core product innovation, but how can they you know, add on things to improve the customer experience. Um, we certainly talked to quite a number of insurtechs that cross into that med tech phase or um, ones that are looking at how you help uh, the end customer and whether that's a work insurance customer or life insurance or a health insurance. Um, but it's, it's, and I think the insurers that, that we certainly talk to are looking for ways to um, improve some of their back end, but they're sort of limited in some ways of what they can actually do given some of the requirements of their system. So um, there's probably lots of opportunity, but it's probably got a way to go. Uh, I don't know, uh, Daniel or, or Matthias, how much um, insight you have into the sort of health sector. Look, I, I, I don't spend as much time in the health sector, but I'd, I'd say it's a, it's, it's a regulated market. So, you know, any premium increase has to be approved. Uh, that makes it difficult. Um, yeah, Medibank in the in the in the in the medical insurance area has just had a major breach. That's uh, you know so they've uh, that that's brought security and technology much more to the fore in this industry. So it's a, it's a big focus for the, the, the regulators and and for the public. Uh, but because it's a regulated because it's a price regulated industry, it's just harder for them to spend more money uh, because they 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 they, they have less less options. Yeah, and, and similarly, I, I also don't spend as much as much time in in the health sector. But just from an amateur standpoint, I, I suppose I suppose there there seems to be uh, just from my perspective, there seems to be so much interesting tech within sort of the, the health uh, sector, uh, but maybe not yet kind of connected to the insurance industry in a way that um, that is super meaningful yet. 
uh, that, that's just my, my brief perspective though, but it seems to be a lot of interesting innovation that perhaps not sort of happening yet within, within the sector as much. Thanks to, to all three of you. And I'll, I'll give a quick plug that we'll be doing similar sessions on uh, MedTech in the near future, early next year. So um, whoever had asked that question, there might be a bit of an overlap there and you might want to join those sessions. Uh, another one that's come in around parametric insurance solutions. Um, the person who's asked the question feels there's not a lot of companies offering these sort of solutions in Australia. Is that the view of the three of you? What is there a scope for a parametric uh, insurance solution in Australia? Yeah, so it's it's been around for a while. We have um, we have one of our, our members who's um, the French insurtech Descartes underwriting who who's um, now quite active. Um, and I think certainly some of the reinsurers are doing things in the bigger scale. So it's it's there, but it's still, I think, fairly early in the take up. So there's still a lot of education going on. Um, and I think the challenge is around just the, the pricing of those products and, and where they fit. Um, so I think there is certainly seen as a growth opportunity, particularly maybe to address some of the affordability type issues in the in the Australian market from sort of climate change. Um, but yeah, still fairly, fairly small in terms of adoption. Um, others, I'm not sure of your um, any other insights in terms of the parametric. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll might just mention that I, I think I think it's a really interesting space, and and more and more insure checks popping up in, in that space, uh, probably in Australia, but also outside outside of uh, Australia. So it might might be a bigger opportunity, sort of within within Australia as well. But but it's also um, and, and agreeing with Simone there, I think it's quite nascent and it's an area that is sort of still forming maybe within the, uh, within the industry and how you, how you actually build it around what, around what specific product and risk and, and sort of the pricing of it. So I think it's a, it's still um, at a quite conceptual level, I believe, uh, but, but maybe not too far away from being uh, realized in some, uh, in some settings. So no, I no, just no, make, no, yeah, sorry, sorry we just, I was going to say there's no regulatory uh, uh, restriction on it, so uh, it, 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 it can be offered. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, if pe people are doing it, it, there's an opportunity there. So if you've got something really good and you think the Australians will buy it, then maybe it is an area that you could, you, you could look at. Uh, it could be a good extension for Avari to add on <laughs> as, as a partner. Um, so, look, you, Daniel, you earlier were talking about profitability um, as a large issue for insurers. Uh, you talked about some of the marketing costs associated with that. Um, is there other things that you think are contributed, contributions to this high cost? Is it admin, regulatory, underwriting losses, high claim payouts? Is there other aspects uh, other than, say, the marketing costs um, that you say are sort of the main reason for it being a, a lower profitability industry than it was before? Yeah, look, I think that there's, there's a whole lot of reasons why, why that's the case. I mean, natural catastrophe has been a big issue. So I've just, so I've just gone online here to, um, so uh, the, 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 two big, uh, the, the two big actuarial firms in Australia, the, the, uh, the independent actuarial firms are Affinity uh, and Taylor Fry. Um, if you go into, uh, if people want to go into either of their uh, websites, so I've just gone on to the, the Finity one. Uh, they have a have a report called uh, Optima uh, Optima Light. Um, I, should, I should be putting this in the chat. Maybe we can, we can follow up afterwards with some with some of these resources. Uh, but that goes through the uh, the profitability uh, of of the whole industry. Um, and, and, and the, the, the big issues have been, and natural catastrophe has been a big one uh, for the long tail classes, the inflation going up has been a big one because that means you know, revaluation of, of, uh, of, of, of future claims. Uh, the, uh, the inflation's also impacted the, the, the cost side of things. So, so it's really a combination. And I think what's, yeah, the, the, the three challenger brands, uh, you know, the, of, of uh, of UE Budget Direct uh, and uh, and Hollards, um, I think they've because they've been smaller, they've been able to focus on underwriting profit and and stealing those good customers. 
And I think that's that impact of the bigger players where, where you know, Yui particularly has a, has a very long uh, process. Uh, well, yeah, they're, they're really after people who don't. Uh, my impression, and there's Yui people on the call, you, you can correct me, but my impression is they're looking for the best customers. They're able to then take those best customers with the lower prices, um, which then leaves others with with uh, with, with the worst book. So um, I, I think it's a it's a combination of things. So it's uh, it, it's 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 right the way across um, uh, uh, across. But but recently, I said high, high claims payouts and that and that impact of inflation have, have, have really played a role. Um, Simone, do you have a you have a, a more of a view on that as well? I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the. As you said, the, the large players have a, a sort of cost advantage because of the scale, um, but uh, yeah, very much the, the sort of natural claims cost over, you know, every year seems to be a unusual year for, for catastrophes and that flows through eventually into the sort of reinsurance cost uh, for businesses. So yeah, depending on, on lines of, uh, yeah, you're paying just, you know, a lot in claims and then, you know, you've got to then pay your, your sales cost and, and, you, and, and keep your margin. So that's the nature of it. Matthias, your views on that as well? Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think uh, you've summarised it well. Actually, I don't, I don't think I have additions beyond that. Um, so yeah, yeah, thank you for summary. Um, and we've just had a follow up question to the the health sector, um, just around what's the penetration of health insurance in Australia traditionally. You don't have the answer to, to that, but I um, mean, I know that there has been a lot of work um, from the government to encourage people to, I guess, take it up with various sort of incentives and um, disincentives if if you don't um, don't purchase it. Um, yeah, I'll be guessing if I, but we can we can look it up and yeah, put it. I, in. Yeah, I, I think we can probably come back with a, a figure if if people don't have it. But that's a good point to raise there, Simone. That um, obviously those who don't take private health insurance. Uh, in the market, do end up at the end of the tax year paying a, a, a money into a into a pool uh, as part of their their tax return. So there is an incentive from the government in the form of a penalty um, for people to adopt private health insurance in some form. Um, just, maybe just, just copy just copy a couple of those industry um, uh, uh, industry things in the chat too. So the Taylor Fry. One and the uh, and the Finity's Optima report. I think they're both. I think they're both publicly available uh, uh, externally. So I don't think I have a special a special connection. But uh, uh, hopefully they hopefully they work for people. Uh, if not, they can just go and go and uh, search those names and uh, and find those two companies. And, uh, and I said our APRA, APRA also has a lot of information. Uh, I, I might just find the APRA connection too. So I can yeah, I think that's a great point around APRA actually, Daniel, because that, that kind of allows you as well to dig straight into the Excel books of, of all the data. You can actually get to a very granular level if, if trying to understand sort of profitability on product class for, for different segments and looking at various companies and so on as well. So that, that's a really good resource as well. Uh, so maybe, Simone, do we want to do some sort of final comments? We've got about five minutes left in the hour. Um, yeah, yeah, I think maybe if, if um, each of you could have, I guess, what would be your, I guess, final advice and, um, you know, where do you think um, the opportunity is for the insurtechs and, and, you know, where do you think they should, should go as a next step if they're interested? Um, maybe start with you, Matthias. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, yeah, so... I guess just summarizing a little bit what I've what I've touched on before. So I think I think there's great opportunity for uh, for foreign insurtechs, including Indian insurtechs, to look at the Australian market if sort of understanding sort of where those opportunity uh, spaces are. And we, we've touched on a few key trends, including sort of uh, the very broad theme of of resilience, but it's also it's different components and, and sort of innovation across the value chain as enablers and also more kind of the digitization of, of go-to-market models um, as well as sort of uh, the modernization and new new propositions uh, for emerging uh, risks. So I think there's there's a lot of uh, opportunity, uh, definitely. And, and um, I think both Daniel and I have touched a little bit on it in terms of just executing on that uh, market entry. It's, 
it's probably just starting with um, understanding how you get into the market and spending some time on um, on the setup uh, to to begin with, uh, and and that might be beneficial to do through sort of a, a few partnerships and thinking through who you might sort of work with in the Australian market, whether it's whether it's actually a commercial partnership or more of a advisory and sort of uh, advisory type role from that from that partnership. But I think there's definitely viable routes to kind of think about how you how you enter the Australian market in that way, just knowing that there's uh, appreciating that there's uh, a few big brands kind of um, holding holding some big shares in, in different pockets. Uh, but no, I, th I think there's um, really exciting opportunities and lots lots happening in the Australian uh, market as well. And I've been super excited learning more and more each year about it and uh, now being in sort of the ventures context as well. Uh, and yeah, so th thanks so much for, for having me and I'll, I'll uh, hand over to uh, Daniel. Great, thanks. Look, I, yeah, I think, I think the, uh, you know, we're, we're agreed on partnerships. I mean, you can't, you can't do things alone. It's, hard, it's, it's, it's a different country where you need to, you need to learn um, about, about how things work here. Uh, look, I, I would say that, and, and, you know, our, our friends at Austrade do this all the time, they, you know, look at, look at market opportunities for, for companies. You know, I would say what, you know, it really requires an insure tech to think, what, what, are, what are my main competitive advantages and how can I take those main competitive advantages to another country? Um, and is that, is that technology, is that experience, uh, you know, um, and I would say there's, there's, a, there's a, 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 a big and uh, continually, it's going to get a bigger issue here is affordability. Um, and, and I would have thought that that is something that, uh, you know, in, in Indian insure techs have thought more about than Australian insure techs. Um, and that would be something where I'd be thinking is, is there a way you could have a micro product that does stuff? You know, I think the conversation about parametric is one where you, where you can get in with a, with a lower price product still provide some cover. Um, so some of those things may be an opportunity. I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying they are. Um, and, and, and really that, that, would, that would lead to my, my, my last bit of advice, which is really do, do your homework. I mean, you have to do your homework. You have to understand more about the market. Um, you have to come here and, and see, what's, see what's going on. Uh, the great thing is we're a very multicultural country. So you can come here and speak to people who've already, who've already been down that path before. I've already been Indian businesses set up here. Um, uh, there's a lot of Indians in Australia, and then there's a lot of every other nationality as well. Uh, and uh, and I think getting over here and un understanding how it works, seeing how you can bring um, your your particular competitive advantage to our market, seeing who you can partner with, uh, and that that would be that that would be the the, the way to success. Um, but we're not the biggest market in the world, so you know that there are bigger markets elsewhere. Uh, but we're we're one that, uh, that that's advanced, uses lots of technology, and uh, and um, you know our, our people use a lot of technology, and and and, and they really want to want to do things differently. So I think that's good. Um, all right, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this. I mean, I, I would just add a final word from me would just be patience, um, and you know, uh, being in for long haul and getting to know people, as as we really talked about. It's a pretty small everyone knows everyone so um yeah having the commitment and patience to uh, to build those relationships and make sure it's right for you thanks simone and thanks to daniel and matthias for giving us their time and insights i you know, we hear it a lot from australian businesses when they look at india but also from indian businesses when they look at australia it's difficult to gauge a market from eight thousand kilometers and so getting the insights from the ground that you guys, you know, they're operating every day is really, really valuable. So I just want to thank you for giving us your time and, and those insights. Um, it was referenced earlier that this is a part of a, a series that we're doing uh, in partnership with InsureTech Australia and the Indian Insure, uh, InsureTech Association. So strongly encourage those that didn't catch the first one um, to head over to the Austrade YouTube channel uh, there's uh, a playlist there with all the Innovation Network um, recordings and you'll find the previous session that we did on InsureTech in India there, uh, which was very well received. So um, I think Smriti will post the link in the chat. I, it hasn't been mentioned yet, um, but 
you know, right now is the height of, it's the best time to be an Australian and an Indian in the Australia-India relationship. We've just had uh, the passing of the legislation around the economic trade uh, agreement that's going to enable a lot more trade of both goods and services between our two countries. That's going to go into force around the 29th of December. Uh, so meaning any business done in the new year, um, there'll be new tariff conditions, more favourable conditions um, uh, around taxation uh, for technology businesses as well. So a lot of big wins coming uh, for firms who want to do business between Australia and India. And um, yeah, we're really at a, at a peak of the relationship bilaterally. And um, I think just to touch on a couple of things that Daniel said uh, earlier, you know, Australia is not often seen as the biggest market um, for Indian tech companies who are looking to expand globally. But what ends up happening is Australia is a really ideal location for a lot of Indian companies who want to test out their technology for the first time in a different scale environment. You know, they're used to a, a high numbers, maybe a low cost uh, business, whereas Australia is a much smaller scale, but potentially um, a higher per customer revenue market. So it's a great sandbox to test your products and services in um, and then to look to expand to other uh, Western economies as well, if that's in your kind of roadmap globally. Um, I th think, you know, Matthias mentioned it a lot, uh, partnerships is, is definitely the way to do that. Um, from the start, we've been talking about it. Whilst Australia is a really friendly business environment and you can take benefit from a very robust IP regime and very tech-savvy customers, um, there are a lot of learnings to getting into the market and there are challenges like any market. Um, and a partner who's on the ground, who understands the market, can definitely help you navigate that and also to, you know, localize your solution, work on your product market fit and pitch to Australian customers. So we have um, what we call the Australia India Innovation Network. That's a program that's run by Austrade, funded by the Australian government. And it's the kind of auspice on, under which we've met today. And really the aim there is to link the startup and scale up ecosystems between our two countries. So if you're interested in the Australian insure tech market, if you're operating here in India, um, we'd love to support you. We'll be working with our partners in the industry and associations on both sides. Um, we can help you, you know, as a, a simple uh, approach to market, market insights, uh, all of these sort of things we're happy to work with you on. And um, yeah, I think probably Simone, you've got an upcoming event in the new year that might be yep. an opportunity for some... Of February. Uh, Yep, 15th of February in Sydney, uh, we've got our InsureTech Live conference. So uh, this is a great opportunity to really, uh, if you are looking at, at coming to the Australian market, to, to come along to that event and, and meet people and, and see what's happening. Yeah, so if, if it's of interest to look at the market, please do reach out to, to one of us at Austrade and we'll obviously connect you through to Simone and her team um, if that's a potential opportunity to go and look at the market more seriously and, and have a bit of an immersive experience during that conference and then potentially meet some people outside of that as well. So we'll be happy to support and, and help where we can. Um, and yeah, we'd definitely encourage people to look at that conference in February uh, as a, an opportunity to open your eyes to the potential Australia holds. So um, in saying that, I think we've probably uh, said enough. We'll, we'll wrap up here. Thank you everybody for giving us your time. And again, Simone, uh, Matthias, Daniel, thank you so much for your insights and, uh, yeah, spending an hour with us to kind of uncover the secrets of Australia. Thanks so much. That's great. Hard to do an hour. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.